Thanks, John. This sign-in sheet here is if you're going to do the tour. So that's not, uh, we've got an actual sign-in sheet going around for the, uh, for the attendance of this session that Mr. Uh, Lindholm is going to pass around. And we, we ask for you to fill that out. So we have that as a historical information for our command so we can uh, show who, who attended. And so I tried to get, uh, on the goodies, I tried to get, you know, these lanyards here for Alabama, but they wouldn't let me do that. So you, you had to sacrifice and get the Army Enterprise Service desk, but no, those are, that's some good information. As I briefed last year with this lanyard, you know, I, I talked about Alabama. We, you know, we won the national championship. You know, who, who knows, maybe this year too. Anyway, I'm, uh, as, uh, as I stated, I'm the uh, project officer for Enterprise Email. I've got a, uh, also a major that works for me that uh, just came on board or works for on the team, and uh, he, he couldn't make it. Uh, he just got newly assigned, but he, he will be the other government lead for the Enterprise e Email t uh, project office team. As, as we get through the brief and we get to the question and answer session, uh, if you could, if you've got a question, raise your hand. And then we'll bring a mic to you because they're actually, you know, I didn't want to use this mic, but they're actually recording this. So we want to get the questions on, on recording and the answer. So uh, when we get to the question and answer session, if you hold your hand up and we'll bring you the mic and uh, ask you the questions. I know we can hear in this room, but it's just for the ones that are here in the recording. So what we're going to talk about today for the enterprise email for the first 30 minutes or so is we're going to go over the customer outreach, overview of enterprise email, how email is structured, and then how DE is created, and then some uh, issues that we've been having with, or things that's going on with enterprise email, how to get help, and then we'll have a question and answer, and then I'll turn it over to, to the service desk. I know some of these slides, if you were here last year, if you attended last year, some of these slides may be similar. Uh, so the first set of eight or nine slides hasn't changed much as far as our program. I wanted to go over this, but we do have a lot of new, new people. And then as we get into some of the BlackBerry current or the current EE issues, we'll, uh, that's some new information that, uh, that we're putting out. So our mission is, is basically work as a, as a PM. We work with DISA, the Army stakeholder, which is NETCOM, our cyber and CIG6, and we work with end users. And so we try to exchange, uh, exchange information to address DE issues. And so we're, we started this customer outreach program about a year ago, r right before this, this conference. And so we, that was our first briefing. We're actually working with the uh, 32 Army commands, DRUs, and, and the four COCOMs that the Army is the executive agent for. We have bi-monthly meetings with all, the, all those commands, whoever attends. And it's not just the enterprise email and title managers that we, that we meet with. We also have some of the IT professionals and any command supervisors that want to attend the meeting. They're usually uh, on a Thursday at 1800 or uh, 830 in the morning and also 1800 in the evening Eastern time to get to Oconus. And so we have that on a bi-monthly basis. So if you want to attend that meeting, if you want to participate, well, what we do is we go over, you know, timely events that are timely things that are going on with Enterprise Email, updates, guidance from the CIG6. We put that out to the commands on, during this meeting. And so we, we encourage participation from any of the commands, user, you know, the IT staff, professionals. And uh, if you want to attend this, uh, one of the contact slides for myself has got an org mailbox. Just send us an email saying, hey, I'd like to, uh, you know, get the invite for the customer outreach for enterprise email. So just an overview of, of our project office. So the Army, when we stood up, uh, migrated Army Enterprise email or dis Enterprise email. The Army stood up an acquisition agency to oversee the service that this is providing. So our office is the uh, acquisition agency, and then CIG6 is the requirements manager, which she couldn't make. Miss Tina Harris and also a new Lieutenant Colonel uh, Zajac couldn't make it for this session. Um, and you, most of y'all know what the <coughs> what Enterprise email is. It's the, the big critical thing for enterprise email is you got a true gal of any DOD employee that has a CAT card. So you don't have to, any DOD, in the, you know, the other branches of the service are all in the gal. You can see their name and their contact information, whatever's on their CAT card. That's what's in the gal. And then that's our current, our current user base for the Army, Nipper and Sipper, and then the current BlackBerry devices. Our program in our SLA with DISA is 
actually spells out BlackBerry, so that's why our program manages the BlackBerry uh, connectivity to your enterprise email. <coughs> There's another program that CIG6 manages and, and uh, DISA has, it's called D DMUC. It's a uh, dis defense mobility, uh, un unclassified, uh, that's your iPhones and your Androids. That's managed by uh, CLG6 our, and our cyber and also with a different per, uh, office that are DISA. So we, we work hand in hand with DISA on the BlackBerry mobility. That's, that's the only mobility we get involved in. So the basics for enterprise email, you have, there's different classes of service. We have two standard classes of service that everybody is eligible for. Is you have basic class, which this is what we what I used to call the old AKO. So when you join the Army or when you become an Army contractor or Army civilian, you get a basic class account as soon as you get that CAT card, and we'll go over that process. The, um, and this is just some of the information on when you get warnings, when you uh, pr prohibited to send and receive, and you no, no longer receive when you're a basic class user. Most of this, these users are those ones that work in the, they work out in the mess hall and motor pool and don't work on a computer on a normal basis, they get basic class. Your business class, uh, the service desk has a uh, ar knowledge article that if you call and you get an active director account, you pretty much are authorized a business class account, and this is the information for the business class account. <coughs> last year, we briefed on the mailbox uh, size uh, policy that was going out last year, and so after that, on January of this year, January of 2016, the Army and DISA came up with three additional service classes, premium, executive, and senior executive. These are allocated by command and the GMs, the group managers that we'll go uh, over in a minute. Those group managers have an allocation based on their VIPs in the command. The premium is 10 gig and you get a, as a general officer, senior executive at the one and two star level, you get uh, a premium mailbox. If your mailbox starts getting over 10, you know, close to 30, then you can, if you're a three-star level SES or three-star um, GO or a Sergeant Major of the Army, you get uh, a 30 gig. The only personnel that get 50 gig are the four-star and political appointees, and that's managed at the Army level. But so your, your command GM will manage the allocation on this. One of the other critical things about this is just because you're a GO, or an SES doesn't mean you'll get a premium mailbox. If your mailbox is two gigabytes, then we're not gonna upgrade you to a premium just because you got a, because you're authorized it. Because we, we pay DISA for that 10 gig mailbox. So we're not gonna pay DISA until your mailbox gets uh, gets up to the 10 gig. So with G, you know, a lot of a lot of GOs and SESs, you know, they they say, hey, I'm a, I'm a GO SES, I need a premium mailbox. Well, if you're, if you're maintaining your mailbox under four gig, you know, like around two gig or something like that. There's no sense in us paying DISA for $150 a mailbox when we can just pay $30, $34 a mailbox for a, uh, a, a, a basic class mailbox. We will, the service desk will upgrade them if they call and they meet the, the rank criteria and, they, and their mailbox is close to getting uh, close to the limit. And just to understand the service desk is doesn't, it's not their responsibility to decide uh, who gets that. They, they actually have a knowledge article from the CIG-6 that outlines who, who gets this, and it's up to the GMs for that command to determine that. So with enterprise email, we went from managing by installation. So when you left Belvoir and you went to Fort Bragg, you had to get another account. You had to do, you know, get rid of your account, get another email address. Well, now that we we're on an enterprise uh, email, we're managing email by command. So how we structure that is we went to headquarters, uh, under headquarters DA, you have the DRUs and the, eight, uh, you know, the ACCs, and you also have the Army is, is the executive agent for four, four uh, COCOMs. We pay, the Army CLG6 pays the, the bill for basic business ac accounts for all those users, but it's it's managed by these commands. So every command has has a command structure that manages their their usage for mail. And this it, the way we manage it is we, at the Army top level we have the CIG six, our office, and our cyber netcom. 
they have Army component managers that we manage the uh, <coughs> the the group managers in in the command. So every command that was on that previous slide, there uh, they have group managers assigned, and those group managers they appoint or elect entitled managers to uh, to be the ones that actually work with the users. The, the title managers are the ones that actually talk to the users and uh, you know go into the system if they if the user qualifies for another entitlement they can go in and give you blackberry uh, journaling if you're a geo or sds a larger mailbox and so forth so that's your entitlement manager are the ones that actually work with the users when they receive the you know the, the when the user calls and says i need an, an, an entitlement in enterprise email in a lot of cases the entitlement manager for a lot of these commands like forthcom and tradoc the entitlement manager is the army enterprise service desk and we're going to go over, uh, Mr. Kelly will go over the Enterprise Service Desk uh, program. But the Army Enterprise Service Desk may, uh, supports a lot of the Army commands out there for Enterprise email and uh, as their entitlement manager. So with this slide here, what, what I want to go over here, and this, this is, uh, I know a number of people that were here last year and that worked with Enterprise email, they they know how this works, but I want to make sure you, everyone knows that how DE is created. We get a lot of questions about, you know, from the from Army or organizations. Hey, I got a new soldier. I got a new civilian. How do they get an email address? We work. Uh, we work with DMDC and DISA. So when a new soldier comes in, new civilian or new new Army contractor, and I'll go into detail on that in a minute. When when they come in, the personnel systems, whether it's TAPS DB for military or the uh, civilian personnel office, when they're entered in the system, that feed feeds DMDC, and DMDC checks their database of all their their, their records across the uh, the DOD and looks to see what's their first name, dot middle initial, dot last name, and if they need a number. That's how the username is assigned. For contractors, it's your trusted agent that goes into TAS, and if they pick Army contractor, then that key kicks off the, the the details to make sure they get an uh, a auto provision an account. A lot of times a trusted agent will go in and pick DOD contractor and then they'll call us ask them why you know why didn't that contractor get an auto uh, auto provision email uh, when he got his cat card It's because that trusted agent picked DOD contractor instead of army contractor. So once you get your once you get your CAC the first day, call you know if you try to get a if you try to get your CAC uh, at the same day that your personnel office puts you in the system, then it's not going to cr your, your CAC card is not going to have a certificate an email certificate on it. You need to wait for the next day, 24 hours to get your that night it, it is when the system updates. Go get your CAC card at that time. Your DE address will be put on your CAC card. And we get a lot of uh, calls from people that say, you know, uh, my personnel system or my my trusted agent put me in, ca in TAS today, and I we got my CAC today, but there's no email address on the CAC. And that's why, because you, they didn't let the system run that night and update their, uh, their email address from DMDC. And then once, uh, w once they get their CAC, the next day, DISA will take that feed from DMDC, and DISA will create their enterprise email address in the GAL and provision them a basic class mailbox. And so the mailbox is automatically provisioned once they get that CAC card. And the, the next day, within 24 hours they get their CAC, it's in the GAL with an email address. And so uh, that's another thing on here. You know, you need to wait to the next business day to look in the GAL to see if your, uh, if your email address is, is, uh, is populated. And so once you get that, everybody has a basic class account. And you're pretty much you have a basic class. The next thing you, you need to do is you need to contact your command or the Army Enterprise Service Desk if you're supported by them to go in and if you've got a uh, if you qualify for a business class account, then you go into the your entitlement manager will go into the system and provision you a mailbox, uh, upgrade you to a, a premium or I mean a business class four gig mailbox. So that's how uh, that's the whole process on how an, e an email address is created for the Army. Now, sometimes if you work in like the uh, in the COCOMs, and they get uh, 
a, new, a Navy or Marine Corps person come into COCOM, well, they, they're they not going to follow this because this is only this is only a uh, work with the Army, DMDC, and DISA. So the Navy and Marines and Air Force, don't they don't have a, a process like this. So the next set of slides, that, that's really the our program, how an email address is created, and uh, the different classes of service. The, the next few topics we're going to go over is uh, I'm going to go over to Mail Connect update, BlackBerry Mobility, and then how do you get help from the service desk. And then we'll turn over to the service desk. So I know most of y'all probably know what Mail Connect is, but uh, the reason I w we bring this up is because uh, we get a lot of questions from from commands or from users out there of, you know, my data in in the, in the gal is not correct. My unit address is not correct. The the uh, critical thing with enterprise email is it pulls off the DMDC Mail Connect database. So when you go to Deers and you update your information, it turns around and updates the gal with your unit organization and your uh, name and phone number, and that's how the gal is updated. And the chief of staff of the Army at the time, back in April of 2014, sent an email to all all users in the Army. They basically said the gal is now populated, and that's the only Mail Connect data feed provided by DMDC, and you all personnel must update their contact data. And he also encouraged commands to incorporate the uh, in their in processing and annual records updates. That, uh, encourage them to incorporate that into their into those processes. So that when you, when you get a new employee into your command. The first thing you need to do is have them go to Mail Connect, update their data, because if th there's a lot of things in the enterprise email when you create distribution lists or dynamic distribution lists where it goes out and reads your data in Mail Connect, if the user hasn't updated that, then he's not going to get an email. If you're stationed at Fort Bragg and you didn't go and update your, your, your installation at Fort Bragg, when they send an email to all Fort Bragg users, you're not going to get that because you didn't update your Mail Connect data. So that's why it's critical for the commands to do that, to encourage the users to do that. The instructions, if you, when you get the slide deck, you'll see that, but it's also on the uh, AKO self page. But this is just a screenshot of that. So this data here, and you can tell this is a retiree and a contractor. This data here is what pulls into their duty location, uh, their duty installation. This in the gal, and then the phone number is further down. And then this is the address that uh, pulls from the gal for that contractor. If you're military, the military, you'll notice there's another tab called unit address, and that that address is not, uh, you cannot update that as a military person. That, ad we get a lot of questions from uh, from users saying, I need that my unit address updated. That unit address for a military person comes from the personnel system in TAPCB. So your S1, if, you're in, if your S1 has you in the right unit, that will feed into Mail Connect and update that data. Okay, the the next big thing that's happening uh, in the next you know few couple of months is the uh, the U we have about nineteen thousand BlackBerry Five legacy users on the enterprise email, and so the headquarters DA put an XOR out XOR one thirty nine sixteen. That for the network modernization XOR that went out uh, last year, that said fourth quarter FY16, the Army has to be off the BlackBerry 5 devices. So your black your legacy devices, are, are they're no longer going to get patches and all that. So we at the time we were given September 30th as a date. So that's the date that's in, in, in the XOR. Uh, so you have to migrate to BlackBerry 10, and so Army organizations are required to purchase you know the BlackBerry 10 devices because a BlackBerry 5 device will not work on the best 12 infrastructure that DISA has. And so that's why you have to upgrade the to the new device. We know that there's a, a shortage of BlackBerry 10 devices that are approved on the uh, on DISA, so we're working with AT&T, Verizon, and BlackBerry to figure out how to resolve the shortage. But right now, CLG6 is saying that there's no waiver uh, you know, at, at this time. And so we're working with DISA and, and BlackBerry to uh, figure out how to resolve that. The next BlackBerry update we want to go over is uh, in, s in October 1st of 17, 
the BlackBerry connection to DISA, which is $36 uh, per year, is no longer going to be funded centrally by COG6. Starting 1 October, the Army commands will be responsible for paying their BlackBerry costs to connect to DISA. This is separate than the BlackBerry cost for the carrier, the, the Verizon and the AT&T uh, service. So that's, that's been put out to all the Army TCOs and Army commands, so they're aware of that. But that's another initiative coming out. The other thing that's coming, or that we're, with the new BES 12 software, the BES 12, the, in accordance with the DOD CIO, the BES 12 will, will support soft certs on your BlackBerry device. And a soft cert is for your encryption or your signature cert, so that way you don't have to have a TAC reader with your BlackBerry. And so we've got two TTPs out there that are on this, these, the sites here. This one here, the user can, can actually do this, and I'm going to go over those few slides. And this one here uh, is more complicated because this, has to, this requires the NEC or the IMO to configure a terminal to have Firefox 32 or older. Uh, that's currently the DOD CIO guidance is, is Firefox 32 or older uh, will only derive the cert. Uh, we know that DISA and BlackBerry and, uh, is working on the, the, was it Purebred? The Purebred uh, software that will allow you to, to derive your cert with that software and derive it and install it on your BlackBerry. That is being worked and tested by BlackBerry and DISA and the, or the DOD. So once that's hopefully in the, in the near future, it's going to be uh, uh, published that it'll be a lot easier for a user to get a soft cert than going through this TTP right here. This TTP right here requires you to take a workstation in your at your NEC or your IMO and remove the current version of Firefox, which is 37 or 39, and then install Firefox 32 or 31, which 31 has got a, is the only one right now with the con. And so, uh, and once you install that, then you can go to the user can go to that machine and, and get their soft cert and put it on their BlackBerry. So we, uh, the one I'm going to focus on the next few slides is really the encryption cert because this one here is the, the user can do this. So if you recall, when a user go, you know, when you get a new CAT card and you need to get your old encryption cert, you go, there's a website you can go to, a DISA website that you can go and pull up all your encryption certs that you've had in the past. Well, you, this TTP that, th this TTP that's uh, on here, tell the the full TTP that when you pull it down will show you how to get to that site and pull that cert down. Once you pull that cert down, you pull the most current cert and you save it on your computer, and then you save it uh, with it'll be this file name here, ARA recovered key key dot uh, p12. You email this to yourself. You go to your BlackBerry. You pull up your email, and you'll see that attachment. If you hold down the long tap menu, import the certificate. Type in that long password that shows on the screen. Then you go to, once you in import it, you go to the actual mail on your BlackBerry. And there on the bottom right, you'll see three dots. Go to settings. Go to secure email settings. And then when you go to secure email settings and turn on encrypt SMIME, you'll, <coughs> you'll see a, a certificate with your name and uh, your EDIPI number, and then you click that, and that's the encryption cert. And from that point on, you can send and receive encryption e encrypted emails on your uh, on your BlackBerry. That that's just a the a quick summary of those slides. That that slide is actually uh, at at the AKO help page for AKO. If you need help with any of that, this is their web link, their phone number. When you dial the number, it's option five for enterprise email and mobile devices. And at this time, I'm going to have Richard go to the computer, and I'll show you real quick. So when you go, Richard, go here to the, the first tab, Army Knowledge Online tab. To get to this, to get to that page, the support page, is you just you go here to help, and click help, and then you get to this link here. So go to that link. And for this TTP, you have to be logged in. So I'm logged in right now with my CAC. Uh, because some of the TTPs that require you to be CAC, F-O-U-O, -O, you have to have your CAC installed or logged in. So he goes here to keyword, types in soft cert.
you'll notice that the first one that comes up is Black Bear Soft Shirt Installation. Go ahead and do double click that. Okay, this is the verbiage in the uh, for instructions, but if you want to pull down the actual PDF, you can go to the bottom and get the PDF version and, and, and put that out to your users that have Blackberry. And they go through that TTP, and it's more detailed than what I just went over. And that's that's on the, the help page of the ASD. Go back up the top. Some other, if you go back to support home, the, uh, right right below ASD, yeah. The other, there's another link for uh, enterprise email here. That's got, if you click that link for enterprise email, that uh, gives you a lot of or a lot more TTPs out there for any of the e enterprise email support that ASD provides. Uh, this is your self help pages that uh, that have that you can get to. Go ahead, go back to the bench. Here, go back to, uh, is it on? The, the present, or the, uh, go to presentation mode, the bottom right, beside the slide. Go to your left, keep going to your left, right there. Okay. So I'm not going to go over that. So that's the self-help page. There's also a link on there that had us, if you can't find your, you know, on the self-help page, you can submit a trouble ticket or you can actually call the uh, the ASD. And these are some other information. We actually have an out, outreach portal that you can get a lot more uh, email TTPs and all this requires is a CAC. If you got a CAC, you can log into it. And then a r reminder just about the uh, bi-monthly customer outreach. If you want to attend that, you can go send an email to this email address here, and uh, we'll send you the invite for those sessions. And this is my contact information and, uh, and Major uh, Barnes' contact information if you need to get a hold of us. So at this time, uh, I know to give Ms. You good? Okay. So this time, is there any? I'll take a couple of questions with Enterprise email, and then we'll turn. I'll turn it over to to Mr. Kelly for Enterprise Service Tips. Any any questions? The certificate when you go to the website and pull it down from DISA. You pull it down to your computer. You email it to your BlackBerry, and you put it on the you put it on your BlackBerry. So that brings up a good point. If you lose, if you lose your if you lose your CAC, and you get a new CAC, you've got to go and and do the same thing because now your encryption cert on that CAC will not work. You got to go get a new CAC, and then you got to do the same thing. Pull that pull that cert down, and install that on the BlackBerry because if if you, if not, then uh, once this once the it, it DMDC revokes that CAC, um, you won't be able to, to pull up your encrypted email on there. Any other questions? And just a reminder, if we don't, if Mr. Dennis doesn't, you know, get through before the 60 minutes, we'll have to ask more questions. Thank you, Donald. Um, I'm Dennis Kelly. I'm the pro now the product lead for enterprise computing. This is a portfolio management job. It's actually has two things in it. So I'll have Army Enterprise Service Desk, but also have the Army Data Center Consolidation Program support for the CIG6. And so uh, tomorrow, Johanna Curry, who's with me, is going to be presenting that program at 0800 tomorrow, along with the Army Application Migration Business Office and what goes on there. And we also have uh, our sister unit from Altez, uh, Mr. Scott Friend and uh, Chad Vance will be presenting at 0930 on Thursday, right? And they also have the capability to assist with application modernization. So that was the commercial part of the <laughs> presentation. So we'll go to Army Enterprise Service Desk real quickly. And actually what you saw was the ideal way 
to use the Army Enterprise Service Center. No phone number, went to a website, had a problem, saw what the problem was, looked up the answer, executed the answer, done. That, that is the ideal way, <coughs> and I'm going to jump to that. The business case for the Army Enterprise Service Desk is right here. We call it shift left. The way we've all grown up and, and worked with IT support is actually here, really, is with a local IMO or a local NEC IT person who comes to one's desk or workspace and fixes the problem. Or we go get even more expensive people to come do it. So that's the expensive way to do it. Ideally, what happens is we move that all the way to the left, to knowledge articles that are accessible so that the individual can solve the problem himself. The step back from that is what's called Tier 1, and these are all ITIL, you know, information technology, information library, uh, you know, guidelines as to how to call these tiers of service. So the end user, Tier 0, when you actually call, get somebody on the phone who's going to help you, that's Tier 1. So the service desk, the Army Enterprise Service Desk, is really both those tier zero and tier one capabilities. As we put them into place, they have mostly been the tier one capabilities. We're actually talking to an agent. Ideally, they resolve your problem on the first contact or the first call, or if not, they refer it back down to tier one. And then a tier, I mean, excuse me, tier two. And if tier two can't solve it, they, they kick it out to tier two. Um, Today, let's say, particularly within 7th Signal Command, the Signal Command arenas, we haven't been able to develop a whole lot of knowledge that we've put forward, which is still to be done. In the enterprise world, like Donald showed you, where we have single procedures that are done globally, it's been easier to put that knowledge together. The reason it's harder in the Signal Commands is we drew up IT from the installation or even sub-installation level. So the knowledge is different depending on where you are and what's being done. For enterprise email, what he went over is the way it works across the globe. Easy to put it forward, easy to get it into a user's hands for them to then execute. Um, it also is related to why Today, for 7th Signal Command, first contact resolution is its best, around 10% of the calls that come in. Commercially, you'd probably see that around 85%. Again, the difference is because we aren't standard in the Army. And so what happens is the agents either don't have the permissions or they don't have the knowledge to solve it on the first call they have to refer it back local. And that's a very, and that's a generalization because, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the Federation. So there are many service desks in the Army at the moment. What I've just been referring to and where most of the uh, disparate way to actually handle IT is within CONUS. OCONUS, um, particularly in Europe, the European theater is pretty much a unified theater. It's run as an enterprise. They can hit 65% first call resolution. Within CONUS, if you are in the Army Reserve or you're dealing with MEDCOM uh, or the Guard, also they have structured their service support areas such that they have single processes. They're actually operating like an enterprise. They can hit 60, 70 percent first call resolution. That's where we're all trying to go. Um, so why do we have a federation? What is a federation? So when they original about 
seven years ago when they decided to start trying to put together an enterprise level service center the idea in the army was to do something like the navy did with n m c i contract out everything so the initial idea was we're going to create one huge global one over the world contract we're going to kind of collapse all tier one service desk into that and then run that um, a few things happened along the way <laughs> one was uh, it wasn't clear there was the legal authority to do that. Uh, there certainly wasn't the money to do that. Uh, and there was a lot of cultural and ins institutional resistance to doing that. So um, it was hard enough just to actually get the 44 installations at 7th Signal Command all on one service desk, and that took four years. So, um, and then sequestration and a few other things occurred. So what happened toward the end of fielding 7th Signal Command and some of the enterprise services that came out, enterprise email, enterprise collaboration, AKA, et cetera, um, the CIOG6 decided that, you know, we've actually already built a number of enterprise level capable desks, like 5th Signal, very mature desks, MedCom, as I said, very mature desks, Army Reserve, et cetera. So he said, why don't we take these desks and, and relabel them and say, they're all really part of the Army Enterprise Service Desk. And we are gonna try to work with them as a federation and between working with them around enterprise processes, since those processes are all the same, and then over time wrap them in technology, call management systems on the front end, uh, workforce management systems on the front end for scheduling, and then ticketing systems on the back end. Everybody's got their own ticketing system. Initially, ideally, we would do APIs between those ticketing systems around those processes where we all touch. Today, the only place we all touch is actually around your mobility service and enterprise email and BlackBerry B6. Those are the only thing, and AKA. Those are the only places all the service desks really touch at the moment in terms of processes that they could all support. Everything else is legacy processes supported in some different way everywhere. Um, but in order to get there, there's a bunch of barriers to overcome as to start to pull that federation together. And some of those barriers are technical, policy. As, as you heard, uh, I think, the speakers today, uh, I think General Hodges, he kept going back to it. The issue's not technical, predominantly. The issue's mostly standards, policy, et cetera. And that's what's happening here as well. Um, so, and you'll see some of these comments, they really all relate to standardization and policy for the most part. And so the step one in actually getting to standard is, well, let's get everybody together, and that's what the federation is doing, and then let's have them start to work around those things that are a priority to start to standardize them. Now, what's priority? Well, what's going to force us in that direction is something I didn't even put on the slides, so these slides had to get approved about six months ago. <laughs> you know, as a uh, part of sequestration, it takes a long time to get travel approval, so these things. Um, so what has emerged in the time since we put the slides together is Windows 10 is now going to be a major priority. I was talking with Tina Hernandez last week, who is the capability manager in Metcom, for the uh, Army uh, Gold Master. And I, I was sitting with her saying, you know, this Windows 10 rollout is gonna be as big a deal as enterprise email. Some of you, I think, lived through that rollout. And she said, oh no, it's gonna be bigger. <laughs> there, is more, there is more detail, there is more infrastructure dependencies associated with Windows 10 rollout than there was with enterprise email. Um, 
So I think what's going to happen with Windows 10 is that's going to be a, a big focal point for the Federation because we're going to be involved with Windows 10 one way or the other. If we do nothing, we are going to be the recipients of that huge spike of incidents that's going to occur and service requests are going to occur as Windows 10 is rolling out. And our agents will be grappling with, uh, I don't know, I need to go find out. I need to refer it to Tier 2. And Tier 2 will go, I don't know either. I need to refer it to Microsoft Tier 3 because we haven't done proactively the things we need to grapple with, need to do to grapple with it. So ideally, what we will do is something, we will get proactive, and I think the steps are already underway to get proactive. And we will put and develop, a, so right now, Fifth Sigma, because they have a mature network, they have a mature service desk, and they are linked with one of the tools that will, as they roll Windows 10 out, it's going to uh, lock security down much tighter than we have experienced in the past. As it does that, things that we do today to remote elevate, you know, we go in remotely and elevate the missions, won't be able to do, like software load. And they're going to want us with their software load to come from a trusted source. So Fifth Signal today with their service desk, they do the service desk uh, activities, but they also perform the SCCM software load. So what will happen is, hey, I need software loaded on my machine. It's called as a service desk. Movement to another part of the service desk, program into SCCM, load that software onto this machine. That's sort of the method that will occur and have to be standard across the Federation as Windows 10 rolls out. We need to understand that to put the knowledge articles that those agents are going to have to use to be able to do that process, as well as, so when they roll Windows 10 out, you, a lot of you may already have Windows 10. Those of you who are Xbox aficionados like myself, <coughs> you can click on the Xbox icon and it'll go to Xbox, okay? <coughs> they are going to disenable that icon in Windows 10 for the Army, but they're not taking it off the presentation panel. So we're going to have a lot of people hit the Xbox icon and go, it doesn't work. And they will call the Army Enterprise Service Desk to say, my Xbox icon doesn't work. <laughs> we want to suppress those calls. <laughs> so we will put knowledge articles together on a landing page just like that for the soft search. It'll say, if you have a problem with your Xbox icon, it says here. <laughs> it'll say, if you're in the Army, we don't use that. <laughs> don't bother. But those are the sort of things that we're going to have to do uh, across the Federation, do it in a standard way, and ideally get ahead of that. If we get ahead of this, we will suppress a lot of the cost that is going to come with doing this implementation. Um, so the only other thing I'm going to cover here real quickly is, uh, so what makes up the technologies that ideally we wrap and enhance this federation with. And this is sort of a list of them. The call management system obviously is a big one. Um, email, the web portals like you saw that Donald uh, you know, demonstrated. This one, we're not so sure it's gonna survive Windows 10. <laughs> Uh, how much we're going to be able to remote is a question at the moment. The knowledge management, that is the key to actually having that shift left really move costs down and actually improve customer satisfaction in the process. I don't know about you, but when I can, like on my machine, if something happens and I can Google it and figure out, oh, okay, do this, I do it, done. I'm much happier than if I have to sit on the phone and wait for somebody to answer me and then tortuously walk them through a solution. Um, 
service catalog, which we're trying to, we have one C4IM. It was sort of originally developed as an IT budgeting catalog. They're already working to try to make it a much more user-friendly, user-facing, customer-facing catalog. Um, the ticketing systems, as we mentioned. Analytics becomes a big one. The service desk, that service desk, I've been talking about it almost entirely so far in this presentation as a uh, IT maintenance function, a supportability function. The Air Force has learned that their service desks are also cyber war front doors. That in conjunction with the ticketing system are quicker at identifying a cyber threat pattern than event monitoring. The Army has sort of begun to recognize that, but we haven't really actioned that yet. We're starting actually to try to get that same level of sensing into our fusion centers so they too can look at those patterns and see and get them quicker than the event monitoring. Um, uh, these B2B interfaces is, is what will make all those ticketing systems that are out there work together initially and then over time also enable some of their consolidation. And this last but uh, sort of not least, workforce management system. So our current desk, the one that uh, if you do the tour is right over here and uh, three blocks down as John mentioned. Um, a workforce management system is a place, is software where skill sets and scheduling all come together. Today in the Army, we tend to try to do that with the ticketing systems, which are really supposed to do workflow. But in the commercial world, they have workforce management software where uh, if I'm an agent, I log on. The software knows what my skill set is. The software knows when I am on duty. The software knows my schedule plan and uh, knows if I'm actually available. So it hooked with the in a, the call management system, routing then goes to the right place. As well as you can uh, size your workforce appropriate to historical demand. Um, so these are sort of the technologies we're talking about ultimately trying to take and wrap around that federation. As well as what will happen with that federation, there will be increasing standardization as the Army increasingly standardizes its functions, like enterprise email. When unified communications or capabilities comes out, that will be another ratchet of standardization. But I think Windows 10 itself, if we actually pulled it off right and used our ticketing systems appropriately, you know, uh, from the DOD CIO level, they really want to tighten down security. Well, part of that will be, as we're rolling out Windows 10, put it in the configuration management database that's a part of the ticketing system, right? Um, and ideally, if we, if we pull it off right, I'm just saying, we would end up with a much tighter understanding of what we've actually deployed what incidents come from those things that we deployed, what service requests come, what the costs associated with them are, et cetera. Um, that all sounds really neat. Getting there is more difficult, <laughs> but uh, hopefully all in the right direction. Let's see, is there anything else we should cover? Oh, well, <coughs> I talk technology. The staffing is, in a sense, what the service desks in the Federation, that's sort of already the floor. Uh, the piece increasingly we're going to have to pull in that we haven't done as much of as ideally we would is a lot of this is going to require uh, business process change, and, and we need to be putting some more business process people into the mix than we have heretofore done. Talked about shift left. So the big initiatives, um, we're standing up a theater desk. So Europe has been very mature. The Pacific is not. The Pacific is still run at the installation level. We're in the process of putting the facility 
together to give the Pacific Theater a theater level desk, um, an area desk for Korea, which will have a, some fall back to the desk in Hawaii for the Pacific. Um, we just started this year a shipper desk in Port Huachuca. There'll be a mirror to it in uh, Fort Belvoir. And we're actually going to make those as near what happens at Tonus because there will actually be shipper nipple desks. Um, we're trying to increase the utilization and the first call, first contact, get it above 10%. Get it up ideally with a with some judicious. I'm looking at Nathan Ford here as the action officer for that. It bears the brunt of what I'm talking about. Um, is to take processes like Active Directory and and move it to be managed at the theater level, and with that, ideally increase the first contact, first call resolution percentage. Um, and we're also trying to take these technologies into other areas. We have a downsizing arm now, okay? And, and things that we used to do manually, ideally, we've used some of these technologies to help us with, like case flow management for MCOM, DPW, you know, the water's out, need to call a plumber. That can be supported by ticketing systems just like IT maintenance can be supported. So uh, 